I was raised in church. I knew all the Bible verses. I sang the songs. I knew the rules. And uh, my family was religious, but that religiosity didn't stop my family from falling apart, and it didn't stop my life from falling apart. All the rules that I learned, they left me cold and empty and lonely. I was tired. I was worn out. I was tired of trying to earn my way into God's good graces. And uh, I wasn't sure if that was even really possible. And I was pretty sure that if it was possible, I certainly didn't have what it took. And that's why I think that when I first walked through these doors 20 years ago, what I experienced took me by so much surprise. I saw people expressing lavish worship to God, clearly having an intimate connection with God. I saw young people sacrificing and spending their youth on serving God as a joy and not as a burden. And what I felt when I experienced that was two things. The first thing I experienced was amazement because I I just couldn't believe you could actually have a love relationship with God. I had never seen it. I had never experienced it. I was amazed. And the second thing I experienced was jealousy because I had tried so hard. I had given up so many things. I had sacrificed and I had scraped to try and earn the right to have that kind of right relationship with God. And I just felt empty. How about you? Have you ever seen someone whose relationship with God was deeper than a cold, impersonal religion? They sacrifice and they serve and they give of themselves and they don't seem to be phased by it in the least. I mean, uh, in fact, they actually grow more and more joy-filled as they do it. They worship lavishly like no one in the world sees and no one in the world matters except for God in that moment. They seem to be engaged in something much more personal and intimate than following rules. They seem like they're actually in love with God. So I want to ask you today, how does this happen? How does someone fall in love with God when there's so much cold religion out there? And how could it happen to you? My friend, I'm so glad that you're listening to this message today. Because I've prayed for you and I believe that this moment in your life could, ha- could potentially change everything. I honestly believe that as we open the Bible, that this could be a moment that takes you into a deeper, richer, fuller, more fulfilling love relationship with the one that your soul is really thirsting for. Today we're talking about how to fall in love with God. And so today I want to dispel a couple of common misconceptions that keep people from falling in love with God, and they might just be keeping you from falling in love with God. It's that very thing that your soul longs for, that thing that you were born for, created for, and you could feel it etching on the the sides of the peripheral of all the good stuff that's going on. There's always that echo, that longing, that sense that maybe there's something more. It is. It's called loving God. And so I want to pray for you right now. I pray, God, in Jesus' name for the one listening to this message. I ask that you would put aside all distractions, everything that's keeping out your word, and that your spirit would move in this person's life right here, right now, as they listen, that there would be a powerful movement from heaven to earth and that you would help them fall in love with you in a way that changes everything, in a way that changes their relationships, in a way that changes what they've seen as religion and how to obey you and and what their life could look like. I pray for that full, meaningful, satisfying love relationship to come right into reach. As we dispel these myths, I pray that you would speak to us. If you pray that with me, say amen in Jesus' name. Let's look at these three. Three common misconceptions that keep people from falling in love with God. Number one, number one misconception is that God wants nothing to do with sinners. We think that. that God wants nothing to do with sinners. Sinners should stay way, 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 way over there, far away from God. But actually, what we learn from the scriptures is that Jesus attracts, not repels, sinners. If you've got your Bible with you or you're in your phone, turn with me to Luke chapter 7, verse 36. 
as we hear a story of Jesus interacting with two sinners, very different from each other, one of them deeply in love with God, one of them moved and propelled by love, the other just on the outside. And I want you to see which one you relate with most and find hope in this message. Verse 36 says this, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her, with her tears, and then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him. What kind of a woman she is that she is a sinner. I'm going to stop right there for a moment. In this story, we have two contrasting characters. Jesus in the middle, and we've got this Pharisee on one side and this sinful woman on the other. Now, the Pharisee was a a religious leader. He was the pious one. He was a rule follower. He was better than others. He was an expert at strictly obeying the law. He had a position, and he was a person demanding respect. He was somebody who had it all together religiously, or so he thought. And I think it's noteworthy that Jesus actually went to the Pharisee's house. Remember, this is a tale of two sinners. And the Pharisees were actually a group of highly religious and highly opposing uh, people who hated Jesus, wanted to destroy Jesus, pull him down, and were eventually involved in his crucifixion and murder. The Pharisees were the ones that were out against Jesus. And I guess it goes to show Jesus really does love people, doesn't he? Even the self-righteous, prideful, arrogant, judgmental people. Jesus loves people. I love that. This was a Pharisee's party, but anybody could come. It wasn't like our parties. If uh, somebody were to show up at your party, you'd say, hey, what are you doing here? You know, you can't be here. But this wasn't the private culture that we live in. The doors were open in his big estate for anyone to come in. And the uninvited were to stay at the edges of the party. And those who were invited would come to the table. Jesus was invited as the guest of honor. We have the Pharisee on one side. On the other side, we have the prostitute. It's not just anyone. No name is given, but verse 37 says, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life. She clearly had the reputation of a sinner, capital S, which was synonymous with being a prostitute and promiscuity. And whatever she was, she was the kind of person that made Simon the Pharisee very self-confident in his own ability to be accepted by God by being so much better than her. Do you know anybody like that? You, th you know if you get around a person like that, you look a whole lot better. Your resume looks better. Uh, your hygiene looks better maybe. Your uh, standing before God looks better because they are so messed up. Now she appears to have known Jesus prior to this encounter and it's likely that she was the same woman from John chapter 8 that was caught in adultery, or at least she was someone with a similar story of public disgrace. And this woman is the first focus in our story here. It says that she brought an alabaster jar. An alabaster jar may sound strange to you, uh, but it held a precious ointment or a perfume. Think of Chanel 5, but, you know, times a thousand. It could cost up to a whole year's wages. It was a lavish and a sacrificial gift. The perfume may have actually been used for her work as a prostitute, but it was the most valuable thing she had to offer Jesus, and she brought it. It says she was standing behind him. Now, you might be picturing him sitting at a table in a chair and her standing behind him, and how would she get to his feet? But they reclined in those days by laying down at the table. Don't think of a dinner table. Think of more like a coffee table where people would put cushions around it and they would lay head towards it, feet away from it, and kind of lay on their side, and that's how they reclined at table. So when she walked in, all she could get to was his feet. It says she was weeping. 
She was very emotional. She was moved. There was something happening within her that was coming out of her. It wasn't sniffles. It was the waterworks. She was crying so much. It says that she covered his feet with her tears. Her hair was down. Now, that might not sound strange to you in our culture, but in Jesus' culture, that was very strange. Women would always cover their head. They would cover their hair. And if you had your hair out, that was a calling card of a promiscuous woman in those days. It says that she was cleaning and kissing his feet. Clearly an act of tenderness, filled with emotions and affectionate kisses. Something was happening within this woman. And then she takes this perfume and she breaks it, this very expensive jar, right at the neck and begins to pour it on his feet. Now, I want you to understand this whole episode took time. She didn't walk up to Jesus and pour something on his feet. She came in weeping, began to wipe his feet with her tears and her hair. And the most important detail is the one that's really not explicitly mentioned here. It's the fact that Jesus doesn't stop her. Jesus lets her do it. And this was just very upsetting to the rule-keeping Simon the Pharisee. He was appalled. Now, he doesn't say it out loud, but Jesus, ruler of all, could hear Simon's thoughts and sees that Simon is absolutely disgusted because Simon has worked hard to be a good person on the outside. And this prostitute has not. Simon was the kind of person who should be close to God in his mind. This prostitute certainly was not. She has no right to be close to God. And if Jesus was really God's son, then he would know it too, and he would want nothing to do with her. Because as Simon thought, as many people mistakenly do, God wants nothing to do with sinners. Does he? That's the first common misconception that keeps people from falling in love with God. Here's the second. That you have to clean yourself up before God will accept you. You have to make all the changes, follow all the rules, and then, and then God will accept you. But actually, the reality we see in the scriptures is that Jesus' forgiveness is the thing that changes our lives, and it's never the other way around. I'm talking to you today about how to fall in love with God. And if you don't understand this, you will not ever, cannot ever truly experience the love relationship that God has always intended with you. See, Jesus' forgiveness is what changes us from the inside out. It's what makes us want to follow him, obey him, love him. It's what moves us to lavish worship. It's what moves us to obedience. The scriptures tell us that if we love him, we will Obey him. And so the story goes. The Pharisee is appalled. He's upset. He's going nuts. How could Jesus let this woman touch him? Verse 40. So Jesus answered Simon. I love that. Simon hadn't said anything. uh, But Jesus answered him because Jesus could hear his thoughts. And he said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me then, teacher, he said. And Jesus tells a story. Jesus is so wise, and he has the ability to convey such powerful, eternal truths through narrative. And so now we get to hear the story that Simon heard that was the invitation for Simon to leave his cold, empty rules of religion and step into an active, transformative love relationship with God. Here it is. Verse 41, two people owed money to a certain money lender. And I want you to notice on a side note, there were two people in the story as well, weren't there? A prostitute and a Pharisee, a rule keeper and a rule breaker. And in this story, there are two people as well. They both owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50 denarii. Tell you what those mean later. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So, what did he do? Did he throw them in prison? Did he demand every cent? What did he do? 
He certainly had every right. They owed the money. But Jesus said what the lender did was he forgave them both of their debts. Both. Now, which of them, Jesus said, will love him more? 500 denarii was about 70,000 of our dollars. 50 denarii was about 7,000. Two people. One owes seven grand, the other 70 grand. Both of them forgiven, Jesus says. Which one will love the moneylender more? What an interesting thing to say. What an interesting term. Have you ever loved a moneylender? <laughs> Have you ever called up your mortgage company to just express your gratitude? Or MasterCard or Visa or the bank and said, I'm just, just, oh, I just can't stop thinking about you in a good way. But Jesus introduces this word here, love. That there should be a love relationship. Of course, he's talking about God to whom we owe all debts, right? And he's saying that love is the response that God is looking for from us. And depending on how much you owe God, how much you're forgiven will affect how much you love. Remember, we're talking about how to fall in love with God. Which one, Simon, will love him more? Verse 43, Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Verse 42, Neither of them had the money to pay him back. Simon reluctantly, hesitantly answers, "Ah, which one will love him more? I suppose the one who was most in debt. And Jesus, again, specific in his word, he says, you have judged correctly. Like, finally, you have judged correctly. You were judging incorrectly, but finally you have judged correctly. God is the money lender, and we all owe him big time, don't we? We owe him big time. And many of us mistakenly believe that we have to clean up ourselves before God would ever want us. But the truth is that no matter how good or how bad we've been, we can never, ever, ever earn God's love and forgiveness. Both of these people owed money and neither could pay him back. And that, my friends is the introduction to the gospel, the good news. Gospel means good news, but you don't understand good news until you understand bad news. And the bad news is none of us has enough to pay him back, but some of us think we do. Simon sure did. We sure did. He looked at this woman who he could call a sinner, but the Bible tells us all of us are sinners. But Simon could say, well, compared to her, I'm not a sinner like she is. But Jesus tells us neither of them could pay. And that's what the good news is, that Jesus came to pay for all of our debts. And those of us who understand just how much we owe, We're the ones that are the most exuberant and lavish in our gratitude for this free gift of forgiveness. Those are the kind of people I met 20 years ago when I walked into this church and I saw them exuberant in their praise, lavish in their worship, ready to sacrifice, ready to give, ready to go and do anything that God said. Why? Because they knew. There was no mistake about it. There was no doubt about it that they owed God more than they could ever pay back and he came and paid it himself. That is beautiful. That makes you love. The one who's forgiven more will love more. And the one who feels like they don't need to be forgiven, well, no wonder they walk around in a dull, dim, meaningless, lifeless, cold, rule-keeping religion looking at others, trying to measure our own ability to please God by how bad other people blow it. But Jesus said neither of them, neither of them could pay it back. And that brings us to the third common misconception that keeps people from falling in love with God. Is that 
Some people think once a sinner, always a second-class citizen. That your past will define your present and your future. And if you're broken, you're always broken. And that's what will define you. But my friends, falling in love with God, you've got to understand that. Jesus' forgiveness sets you free from the labels of your sin. Jesus' forgiveness sets you in a whole new reality. Watch this. Verse 44. Then Jesus turned from Simon to the woman. Remember, he's at the table talking to Simon. This woman was not even invited. She's, you know, wiping his feet and crying over him. And he says, Simon, who loves more? He says, well, the one who's forgiven more. And Jesus then looks at her, the one whose debt is greater. He turned towards the woman and he said to Simon, he turned towards the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you didn't give me water for my feet. That was a common practice. They'd walk around in sandals. Their feet would be dirty. There'd be someone there at the door to wash your feet. You'd take off your slippers, your sandals, and you would sit down to a meal. You didn't give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured out perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven or they're still forgiven. Simon. You feel completely justified, don't you, in judging this woman, but you've judged her wrong. You think that her sins define her, but what you don't realize, Simon, is that she has been forgiven. That's why she is so lavish in her love for me, because I forgave her of a great debt. And then Jesus elevates this woman and puts Simon in his place and he shows us how God sees the broken and how God sees the sinners and how God sees the ones in need. He says, you didn't wash my feet, but she did it with her hair and her tears. You didn't kiss my cheek, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You didn't anoint me, but she used the expensive stuff. See, these were common courtesies for a guest of honor, like taking your coat, offering a drink, and Simon Oh, he was so far removed from being in that type of need. He merely invited all of these people and sat down at the table. And you see the difference in their worship, don't you? You see the difference in the way they treat Jesus, don't you? One of them could care less who's watching. One of them is so deeply moved and so in love that she's pouring out her most lavish worship. She's emotionally connecting. She has an intimate relationship with God. And Simon sits sideways and judges and doesn't understand and is at arm's length from Jesus. He was projecting her past into her present. Jesus projected her future into her present. And he saw a forgiven soul. He said, your sins are forgiven. And friends, you've got to understand it's not because, not as a result of the works Forgiveness was the cause of her works. She washed and kissed and anointed his feet because she was forgiven. This love that she's expressed was an outpouring that comes from a heart that has truly been forgiven. She was in love. How do you fall in love with God? Well, you've got to experience his great forgiveness. You've got to come to the place where you're willing to admit you need it. And stop looking at other people online, on videos, on TV, in your house, at your job, and being like, at least I'm not like them. Listen, you could do that if you want to. Go ahead. Make a list of all the ways that you're better than them. And you know what? You can satisfy your own self that much. But before God, there is no comparison. You cannot earn God's favor. If you could, what would be the point of Jesus coming and dying on the cross, right? None of us can do it. And instead of pretending like we can, why don't we engage in receiving the forgiveness of God? 
If we do, we fall in love. This is why she came. She came to thank her Savior, to thank the one who loved her. Her weeping wasn't from shame. Her weeping was from gratitude, too intense for words, from a love too deep for verbal explanation. Jesus said, forgiven little, love little, referring to the Pharisee's mindset. I'm okay. I don't need what she needs. But my friend, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. So as we think about how to fall in love with God, I want to tell you it is possible. In fact, you can fall in love with God right here today. There's three people that I want to talk to. I want to apply this. I want to wrap this story up and just ask you, which one of these three people are you? Three people that can fall in love with Jesus today. The first is the person who thinks you're too bad for forgiveness. You fear that Jesus wants nothing to do with you. You think your sins and your debts are too great for God to forgive, but I want you to know this. Hear me. Oh, you've got to hear me. Jesus loves you just the way you are. He came from heaven to earth to walk the streets as a human, to go on a cross, to pay for the sins that you've committed because he loves you. Come to him. If you think he can't forgive you, if you think he can't give you a new life, come to him today and experience the acceptance from a God who wants you, who loves you, who made you, who knows you, who always intended to be the one to pay for your sins. Come to him today. Verse 48, Jesus said to her, your sins are still forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who can even forgive sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. It isn't her works. Your faith, what is faith? Faith is believing this message. It's grabbing a hold of the promise that you can be forgiven through Jesus' work on the cross, not your own work. That's faith. It's saying, yes, God, I accept it. Yes, God, I believe it. It isn't any attempt to get cleaned up that saved her. It isn't washing or kissing or anointing his feet that saved her. It's faith, pure and simple, humble faith. You've got to lower yourself to the place you really are, to accept God's forgiveness. But when you do, you experience that love relationship. You experience the curtain going down that separated you from him. It's what I experienced over 20 years ago when I realized that it wasn't my good works that were going to get me into God's good graces. It was Jesus' good works. It wasn't my longing for God that could make the distance. It was his longing for me. And Jesus told her, go in peace, peace, peace with God, peace from yourself, peace in your soul. Jesus wants her to be secure and knowing that God has seen her faith, that that her belief in his forgiveness is secure and she is forgiven. Security that her debt is gone, secure in his love. So if you think you're too bad for forgiveness, you're not. The second person who can receive this love relationship with God is the one who thinks you're too good. One of you thinks you're too bad for forgiveness. One of you thinks you're too good for forgiveness. Like Simon. But the Bible tells us, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all, 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 all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You think you're too good for forgiveness? You watch the news, you watch the TV, you go online, you see the people, the bad people. You see them. Oh, they're bad. They're clearly bad. Not like you, though. You're not bad. You're not that bad. Not compared to them. Oh, but the scriptures would tell a different story compared to Jesus, though. The judgment in your heart. The pride, the arrogance, the thinking that you could do it on your own separates you from God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, no one is righteous, not even one. There is no one. Remember verse 42, neither of them had the money to pay him back, and neither do you. If you think you're too good for the forgiveness of God, that you don't need it, you will never truly experience the love relationship that God has intended for you. 
And whether you owe 7,000 or 70,000 or 7 million or 7 cents, the debt can be wiped out by Jesus' work on the cross if you're willing to accept it. And when you do, you experience forgiveness. And I want to say, my friend, until you do that, you'll struggle to worship, you'll struggle to love Jesus until you admit your need for him and receive his forgiveness. You also won't forgive other people. You also won't be able to extend the love of God because you can't give it if you don't have it. And the word says we love him because he first loved us. And we love others because we love him. So if you want to fall in love with Jesus, you think you're too bad for forgiveness, you're not. You think you're too good for forgiveness, you're not. And the third person, and this is probably you, who needs to fall in love with Jesus today is the person who forgot how Jesus forgave you. You know what I'm saying is true. There was a time in your life when the fires burned bright. You were in love. You would cast us off all of the others. You would do whatever it took to be with him, to spend time with him. You loved him. You were moved. You were even moved emotionally by your intimate relationship with God, but somehow, some way, along the line, as your life began to change because of that love, you forgot what a messed up sinner you are. All the outside stuff changed, but the need for God remains the same. And I want to remind you today that it cost Jesus his very life to forgive someone like you, someone like me, Remember today that without Christ, you would be condemned to an eternity separated from God. Remember that you could never have paid your own debt. Jesus doesn't accept you because you changed your life, because you lavishly worship him, because you pour out any sacrifice. All of that stuff changes because you're forgiven, because you're loved. And out of that love comes this great, beautiful, intimate relationship with God. Your love for God is determined by your forgiveness from God. Verse 47. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. It's the forgiveness of God that becomes our lavish worship for God. Forgiveness from God becomes our lavish worship to God. So let's admit the great need we have for God's forgiveness today. And may that forgiveness become rich love for God in us. And may that love for God fuel our obedience to him and love for others. I want to pray with you. Lord, I pray for my friends now here, all three friends, the friend who thinks they're too bad for your forgiveness, the friend who thinks they're too good for your forgiveness, and the friend who's forgotten how you forgave them. All of us today, together in this moment, come before you saying, oh God, we could never make ourselves good enough to be accepted by you. We say we believe that God sent his son, Jesus, to live a human life, to fulfill all of the rules perfectly, and yet to be murdered on a cross meant for sinners like me, paying the price for us. Oh, we today, like this woman who lavishly poured her life out before you, we say, God, we long for an intimate, vibrant, personal, real, hot, fiery relationship with you that covers everything in our life. And so we come back to this place of gratitude, to this place of worship, to this place of acceptance that we could do nothing apart from you and you did it all for us and we accept it. So we invite you now to change our lives. Give us the motivation from love to obey you, to follow you, to walk with you into this great adventure and to escape the lifeless, loveless, cold, dark, empty religion that threatens to capture us up thinking we could do it ourselves. We love you, Jesus. We bless you, God. We worship you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Friend, I want you to know that if today you've believed that message for the first time, you've started on a new path, a new journey. And I want you to reach out to us and let us know. Go in the comment section and reach out and let us know. Say, hey, I, I'm starting a new relationship with God right now. We would love to come alongside of you. We would love to walk with you. That's what happened to me 22 years ago when I was making that decision that you're making. Somebody from the church came alongside of me and helped me take my first steps with God and mentored me. And we've got resources for you in our app, the New Life app. It's called Begin. Go to the resource section, click on Begin, and you can begin right now on your new journey with Jesus. We love you so much. This is a church that believes that you have a call from God, and we'd love for you to be more a part of it. So... Keep connecting with us online during COVID. We have live outdoor uh, worship uh, during these good moments when the weather's good. We'd love to see you there, and we'd love to hear from you and see how we can pray for you and serve you. We love you. God loves you. God bless you. And may you enjoy a vibrant, passionate love relationship with Jesus that changes everything because of his great forgiveness in your life. Amen. God bless you.